Oh, what's up, everybody? Got a great guest and super bombastic drummer and cult leader and ex-Gazas, Casey Hansen. And in talking to him about both life in Salt Lake City, where he's from, and punk rock, I somehow forgot to ask him if he had seen the movie SLC Punk, i.e. Salt Lake City Punk, starring Matthew Lillard, who people have always told me I kind of look like, which is super weird. Anybody remember that fucking movie? In any case, we get into all sorts of goodness, including the family that your band becomes, balancing his hard-hitting style with live performances versus studio recording, and the stressful nature of the latter. Plus my rant on getting lost in his amazing state of Utah, and of course, influences, and a whole lot more. Also have noticed that I caught up with Casey during Cult Leader's run with New York Local's Primitive Weapons. Feel free to check out my interview with drummer Chris Enriquez for episode 74. Also on that bill is the incredible Swedish grindcore, crust punk, bombastic, hardcore killers godmother, whose drummer Michael Dahlstrom I also spoke to on episode 67 of the Crash Bang Boom podcast. And if any of you have not seen Godmother, you are doing yourself a disservice. That band is straight fucking crazy town live. God, they are so good. Let's check them out. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're looking at putting out vinyl for your next project, go on over to NewOrleansRecordPress.com to check out their real-time quote generator. Get info on record press and variants in 180 grams and 150 grams, as well as 12 and 7-inch records. Plus packaging, mastering, lacquer cutting, electroplating, and even assistance in design if need be. So check them out, and that's NewOrleansRecordPress.com. Vinyl sounds good, smells good, looks good. It's got all the good. Hit them up. Crash Bang Boom Podcast is available on SoundCloud as well as iTunes Podcast, as well as my YouTube page, Stitcher, and more. Check out my Instagram and Facebook pages and give me a like, a subscription, a glowing review, five stars. Hug me up. It'd be appreciated. So here we go. Casey Hansen, cult leader. New album, A Patient Man, out now. Go marvel at Casey's ridiculously, absurdly awesome wrecking ball style of playing. Dude is a beast. Crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, yep. Casey Hanson, what's happening, man? How you doing, dude? I'm great. How are you? Doing pretty good. It's chilly. I rode my bike down here to St. Vitus Bar, where y'all are playing tonight. By the way, congrats on the new record, Patient Man. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, how's this run been going thus far? Uh, it's been great. I, I try not to expect much. I've been doing this a long time. I guess the reason I bring that up is, is just because this seems like a particularly good uh, response yeah. um, versus everything over the years. But Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, been really good. And it's just about a three-week run. Y'all are mixing up some bands. I know uh, Primitive Weapons is yeah. on it yeah, uh, for Weapons. a little while. And then who else? Who else is picking up some dates on this? Uh, Echo Beds does the last six. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so from Texas um, through the end. Right on. Yeah, very cool, man. Uh, well, like I said, congrats on the record. It does seem like it's been uh, pretty well received, uh, and I think the I, I would imagine that the show's part of the response that you're seeing is doing part to the record, which is cool. Yeah, very much. Tell me a little bit about uh, recording this record because this is the second full length that y'all put out, and once again working with Kurt Blue out of God City Studios, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. People like to talk about how sort of hardcore he can be in his uh, critiquing of one's performance. You know, I <laughs> I suppose much much like many things that it, that's up to interpretation yeah i i like having a taskmaster that is willing to cut through the crap and give it to me straight i i'm certainly guilty of sometimes sometimes being soft on the truth in the interest of kindness right but for that reason i'm also very wary of compliments um i, I don't know if people are just being nice to me i i love compliments from people that i know aren't scared to tell me the truth right that's when they mean something i guess in that spirit i know if kurt is 
uh, riding easy and everything is going great, then things are going great. Right. Um, but you know, uh, one, one of the one of the big selling points for me on Kurt is um, is that guidance. Um, cause there are a lot of engineers that um, just either don't know what to say or they don't want to meddle or whatever. And and Kurt definitely is respectful of of um, the process and the band's autonomy and everything. Yeah. But he's he's not scared to say what needs to be said, and he really understands that line. Yeah. So his, his feedback is always really appreciated, on top of um, his technical prowess and his knowledge of music, uh-huh. and, and and also kind of having a good understanding of what we're trying to do, where we're coming from, and and both in his background, um, in his previous work, and also uh, in having a working relationship with us. He yeah. he catches on to what we're doing pretty quick and um that's really helpful in in the whole process so yeah i think he's great at capturing if there's a, a raw energy within a band i think he can make a pretty big sounding record and still have it raw like yeah. uh, the baptist records for instance and nick like nick yakishin's drumming on that i spoke to him and big like just great sounding records that still have raw energy and i think he definitely captured some of that dark raw chemistry that your band has and it's uh, it's a big sounding killer. The drum sound fucking badass on it. Yeah, we um, we tried some different things. I think on every other recording, besides a patient man, I've used my drums. You know, touring to God City and back a couple of times. But this time it was our lives are a little bit different. Timelines are a little more constrained. So we flew out. We used what was there. Um, what did you end up playing on the record? This is what I feel bad about. I can't remember exactly. I should pull up some <laughs> photographs. I th- really? I think I used a, I think I used a Maple twenty two by eighteen kick. Okay. I think the toms were fiberglass. Really? Um, I can't remember the sizes except that I had a sixteen by sixteen, and then I supplemented it with a sixteen by eighteen. Okay. Um, and what we figured out, like while we were trying stuff out. Um, we, we had the 16 by 18 on my left side uh-huh. and the 16, 16 on my right. So what he could do is actually like pan it and make it stereo. Oh, cool. So that it's like when I hit both of them, right, it's, it's like super, massive. super ridiculous. <laughs> That's badass. Um, so That's that was great. like a little cool wrinkle. Yeah. Um, and I, I can't remember who made those drums, um, but they're just, they're super, super clean in their tone like yeah i i describe it as like there are notes like when you hit it it's a note They're super tonal it's yeah. not yeah it's not just like a bone bud yeah it's c or right you know, whatever. yeah <laughs> but yeah super responsive um super cool nice well uh and we'll talk a little bit about it as well one of the things that i've always been impressed with in seeing you live was just the, the sheer brutal physicality of your playing uh but when you're in the studio do you still do you still attack with such ferocity? This question is a an ongoing battle because um, <laughs> I, I I know the conventional wisdom says to play with a very deliberate, consistent intensity. Uh huh. I kind of piss on that a lot. Uh huh. Just because I want to not 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 like conceptually, not like I yeah eh. consciously making an effort. Yeah, to do it, like no, I'm not like trying to reinvent something. I just it's fun to play hard right and it's weird to me that when they don't play hard yeah because I, I don't know it just it feels like that's what you're supposed to do when the music is angry and like yeah it is captured as well i think sometimes overplaying uh or just playing with that much intensity when in close mic scenarios you can kind of push the drums beyond the point where they don't sound as good. So I think that's one of maybe producers sure. or engineers' insights into it. Yeah. But in the case of you... I mean, in the case of recording, I, I definitely try to tone it down largely because I know I'm going to be in there for... That's the thing. I mean, depending on how long it takes to get sounds and where you're at right. in the process, anywhere between two and ten hours, and you have to be able to keep yes. at it. Yeah. So, um, and, and like... I'm guilty of constant revisions too. So like, I'm not a sit down, do a take kind of guy. Yeah. So, I mean, if I had all my stuff perfectly rehearsed and down, like maybe I could go for it a little bit more, but in a situation like that, with that equipment, 
with those ears and yeah, all the stuff. All the variables, yeah. I don't think it's as important to like try to kill your drums on every single thing. So For I, sure. I definitely play back when recording versus live. And then live. It's full bombast live from what I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, that's the way you wrote those parts. That's the way you play. Why would you not play it that way? You know? Sure. I, except I'm now starting to use sound check as like my own little warm up and I like try to work in beats and whatever. Yeah. And so when we did sound check, I was kind of like was feeling the rhythm and I, I wasn't killing my drums and I was just kind of playing. I felt like I was playing like a, like a real drummer plays. <laughs> like my posture was good. And oh, like, the whole thing. I was just like <laughs> vibing instead of just like, ah, right. And Destroying. I, and I played well and I'm just kind of like having an identity crisis right now. Oh no. I, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's all a work in progress. So. Right on. Well, I think at some point your body and or your age, depending on how long you want to do oh, this, God. Yeah. The, that will dictate your, your form and or ergonomic adjustments. You know, yeah. that's, yeah. you'll, you'll begin to notice it. Yeah. Well, and, and I've started thinking like anatomically about like what it means to have posture and, you know, you open your thoracic cavity versus when you're hunched over. I've tend- noticed that I've been hunching over as of late and I didn't yeah. realize I was doing it and I've been watching video and I'm realizing, man, I gotta, I gotta correct this a little bit. I used to not do that. It gives you wind. Like you gotta, I know. you gotta open that up. It gives you energy. It gives you, but, but like the way I like to hit my drums, especially my cymbals. And I know you're, I know you're not supposed to hit your cymbals hard. I know you're supposed to hit your drums hard and not your cymbals. I don't give a shit, but I like to use my back. You know, yeah, you I like cr- to you crash flail into my whole upper body, so that lends itself to kind of hunching over. But I'm I'm trying to kind of polish some of these things. Right. Learn from the people that know a whole lot more than me. Yeah. So I've called your playing and seeing it live like a lesson in upper arm playing. You know, because there's <laughs> like like jazz, for instance, is so much more wrist oh, and like hand it's technique. Beautiful. You know. It's beautiful. Uh, and then with you, you really are playing. It's it, you generate a lot of, from your upper body. It's it's an interesting physical yeah. uh, experience to to witness. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you're t- when t- going back to like tracking drums in the studio, I always get stressed out doing that. Do you find being in the studio and tracking drums stressful? Uh, I'm taking my time trying to find the words, but the, the answer is yes. I'm an anxious mess to the extent that I almost, I don't know, I feel like I, my plan has always been a little bit affected in the recordings that I've done because I can't really get my head. I mean, I, I get into it, I guess, at, at a certain point maybe, but... I'm always super stressed out about it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, same. It, and it's 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 weird too because you know I, I listen back on everything we've done and sometimes I'm like, oh wow, I pulled that I pulled that one off or I don't know where that came from but it sounds great. Right. And there's other things where I'm just like, oh, I can still hear this thing. And I'm open to criticism. I'm like comfortable with it as long as they're not identifying the thing I'm weird about. <laughs> but thankfully, so far, nobody has called out any like, um, at 127, um, there's a stroke that, yeah. Uh, I haven't had any of those yet, so wow, I'm I'm good. But yeah, I I of course get nervous. I yeah. thought about taking beta blockers and stuff. Then that would affect your performance that much more. Probably. You can't do that. Because it 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 would probably take out some of the the excitement that you play with would be affected by that. Yeah. Just 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 prepare. I, right. I think that's the always the lesson. Always be confident prepare. going into it, so that that's one less thing that you're exactly. stressing out about. Yep. Yep. Did you have you, did you study with anybody, or are you pretty much self taught, or? I am mostly self taught. Okay. Um, I took percussion ensemble. In, ju- in junior high. Well, it wasn't percussion. On, I was just in the percussion section in of the, the concert in the band. School band. School band. So it was mostly learning when not to play. Right. And were you playing the triangle? Like you had the one triangle. Oh, note they. The inter- they. Well, sometimes. I mean, we. <laughs> That's so embarrassing. A, I've done that too. We had a really interesting group. We had like eight percussionists. Really? Because they just like didn't have the heart to tell us like <laughs> to no. We need three. We don't need more than yeah. that. And nobody ended up quitting. So like there were times where we'd play like. We were short a tuba, so we'd play a synth tuba yeah. on the you know keyboard or whatever. But that's hilarious. I mean, it, it, they, we learned the gamut of stuff, but only the stuff, only so well that you could get through one of those songs. And the, the technicality on that stuff is, is virtually nothing. Um, high school did percussion ensemble, learned a little bit more about the craft, but I mean beyond that, no, I I, I never took lessons uh, as far as drum set, especially like uh, that was 
basically all self-taught. Uh, I do have to like put a pin in this. I did take lessons from Lynn Brown, who's a professor at Salt Lake Community College. Okay. Like last summer though, like it oh, was really super. And, yeah. and it wasn't drum set. It was mostly like rudiments uh-huh. and learning traditional grip. I, I even did the marching band that summer. And nice. Whatever it was. It was a learning experience. It's it's what <laughs> you would imagine a community college marching band would be. But yeah, I it was like kind of important to me um, because in high school I just wasn't with it. Yeah, and I I didn't do marching band, and it just felt like something I I had to do. Yeah, I once. did it. I did and, it. I did it growing up, and it was good. But it was good because like you really drill your your cadences mm-hmm. and your rudiments and your I mean. You're using your body as the metronome, and so it's it's really conducive to a lot of concepts. Sure, uh, you just have to kind of like extend um, to to apply to you know playing like I play now or whatever. Exactly. But, well, yeah. with uh, with in school, how were you as a student? <laughs> uh, nervous wreck. My first go around, I, I was a, I was a dropout. It was a spectacular failure. Okay. Um, I, I don't want to say I was too smart for my own good because that's just arrogant and weird and incorrect because ultimately it was stupid um but i just i just didn't vibe with it i found every reason i could to not do the work and yeah it's a huge regret um but two years ago after we got back from uh, a tour with dillinger escape plan i went back to school and uh have an associate degree now which cool like that's more like a marker you know right like, halfway to whatever <laughs> yeah. um, but all the same it was a big like kind of obstacle in my mind right like I, I, I used to have dreams like well, nightmares that I was like back in school I still not, have not, be- not because I had like the social anxiety but uh-huh. because it was just like yo you dropped out like you couldn't get through public school like and it just nod at me yeah um, my first semester I got a 4.0 on 15 credits which felt pretty cool nice but I, I'm 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 kind of obsessed with preparation to the point that it's almost debilitating. Uh huh. Like I'm just thinking about how I should study and how I should do this paper and how I should do this thing before actually getting to it. And then by the time I get to it, it's like, oh geez, I have a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but I mean, the work turns out still uh, pretty all right. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I guess we're much the 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 way in in which we are students is in many ways the way that we are in life so yeah well I mean that's it's a little bit of a twisted sort of self-perception and I struggled with it as well in basing myself after I got out of like academic pursuits or whatever and I think the way that I thought about my own intelligence was hinged on ultimately how I wasn't very good in in academic realms Mm. So and then I realized, oh, I'm, I'm not I'm not stupid. Uh, I was uninterested and yeah, yeah. Uh, a little scatterbrained. And um, I think the uninterested thing is a big thing, because, I mean, in public school, you have all these mixed kids coming from different areas, different socioeconomic backgrounds, different cultures, everything. And they have one broad stroke means of trying to teach everyone. And it's not going to work with everyone, especially, I think, someone who's probably more prone to artistic endeavors or has kind of a, is fairly anxious. I think most drummers are particularly ones that play in heavy music. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that's something that, that I found. But it took, I'm 42 now, so it did take me a long-ass time to get out of that to where I just kind of always assumed I was stupid. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how anything works, but how, like, particularly how people can arrive in the same place and all the different routes to get there. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but, like, my situation, I feel, is, like, in, in a lot of ways opposite to yours because mine was, like, it was so homogenized. It was yeah. mind numbing. Oh, wow. I mean, okay. Everybody's white. Right. Probably 80 plus percent were Mormon. Oh, wow. Um, like I'm in the suburbs in Utah. So right. like we're talking like just another world. Yeah. I'm in the and, deep South. So we're oh, talking well, about two completely go. different worlds. Not that different. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even, even, even being in Utah now, it's like Salt Lake is like, okay, cool. I like Salt Lake. I, I really 
I love Salt Lake. Yeah. And then the second you cross the county line, it just changes. And you're, yeah. And you're in the sticks again. Mm-hmm. But for sure, I just resisted all of that. Uh-huh. I just resisted all of the church shit, all of the institutional making me into a thing. Right. Thing. It was just I don't know. I guess the shorthand is maybe punk. Like, yeah. I, I was never like a kid with a mohawk, but right. I, I took the idea of punk and I just kept pissing on it. A little bit of a contrarian. Yeah, definitely. I, I, <laughs> that's a great word. Um, yeah, and, and I've learned a lot about contrarianism in that time. Right. But, uh, yeah, I just I didn't want any part of any of that. And I, so I lost, I lost sight of the value in what was there because of the things that didn't have value to me. So right. the, the baby in the bath water yes. thing. Um, so if, for all the kids listening out there stay in school you goddamn idiot yeah you're you're there anyway right just finish <laughs> and like get it out Figure of the it way out later yeah just get it out of the way right do it right yeah uh how much of that sort of rebellious punk nature and uh alienation or whatever it is that you were feeling in regards to your surroundings and religion and all that how much of that do you think is tied into the physicality of your of your playing because I feel like that that would kind of make sense. It has to be a pretty cathartic thing for you, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that I'm all that well adjusted. I don't know <laughs> that I ever will be. Right. Um, and, and I think that's what uh, makes me gravitate towards all of this. Yeah. Um, I just expressionism in, in general, music mm-hmm. and art and whatever else, however you want to phrase it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I... I don't know. I, like, I, I guess kind of going back to something I was saying earlier, it's just like you get you get to play hard. Uh huh. So fucking play hard. Play hard. Yeah. Like like I, I feel like it's at some point in almost everyone's life, they you know they hear a cool drum part or they. I'm tr- I'm, I'm trying to think of a perfect example. Really, anything that Dave Grohl has done. Yeah. Sure. Um, or. Uh, What's that that song by Boston? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Take the name. a look around. Or right, whatever. right, right. I like that's one of those moments where I think a lot of people are just you know they're air drumming, air drumming. and they're like getting into it. Yeah, Phil but, Collins in the, in the air of night. Yes, Phil is, Collins. That's the ultimate one because I swear to God, whenever that comes on at a bar, I'll look around yes. with just panoramic vision, and, and man, everyone, drummer, not musician, whatever, wherever they're from. Everyone, everyone, everyone knows that fucking Phil, dude. And they want to do it. And, and they, they want to do, do it hard. And they love. Right. So like, <laughs> so you get to do that. Like, yeah. you're, you're not just playing pop. You're not just like the music demands it of you. Yeah. So how could you do anything, anything less. less than that? For sure. Um, so I just kind of try to embrace that. Uh, but it's also, again, that, that balance of like being pro versus just like going for it and right. just being true to your emotions and whatever and um but yeah I, the 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 repressive oppressive whatever stuff i yeah i i never really never all the way leaves sure um but i i don't know the, the contrarianism thing is, yeah is in there too, <laughs> just, just generally speaking so right i don't know Well, uh, drumming wise, man, uh, was there any particular record or or player in particular uh, that you feel like was kind of a cornerstone that either made you want to pick up the drums in the first place, or then after you had picked him up, you were like, whatever this guy is doing, I gotta get on this. Oh man, oh, trade secrets. No. Um, <laughs> what's weird is I, I've I've now met some of these people, right? And, um, it's really neat. <laughs> um, but I'll say I'll say Abe Cunningham. 
uh, from the He's Deftones. awesome. It was a really big I one. saw a picture you took with him, and you were you couldn't have grinned any any wider. Wow. Yeah, the corners of your mouth look like they were in your ears. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, um, he is so awesome. I love that guy. Yeah. Plan. Well, and he like he knows his stuff. Like he's he's trained and everything, but he just he vibes so hard. He plays in the moment. I don't I don't know if it's purposeful or not. I, but the the times bend, the tempos bend in their songs yeah. live dramatically. I think it's purposeful, but ultimately I don't care because right. it feels cool. Yeah. And like he's always got these really interesting out of left field kind of ideas once in a He'll while. He'll do some linear stuff like, in his grooves and yeah, um, another hard hitter with a great pocket. Yeah, he's, exactly. He's killer. Um, I you know, Ben Kohler. I, I feel uh, like fairly obviously. Yeah. Um, that guy needs to play in more bands. He's not playing in enough <laughs> bands, right? That's his real drawback. I've, I've talked to him on the podcast as well. So, yeah, I feel the same way when I think about, like, hardcore drumming or, like, any of that sort of punk metal fusion, whatever you want to call it. He's, god well, damn it, he's so good. Well, uh, yeah, I feel like the way he kind of does, like, interprets a lot of metal concepts in drumming is so real. Yeah. Where with a lot of these players, they're um, they're so fast and they're so I don't know triggered or I, I don't I don't yeah. know. It's like not I can't grasp it. Yeah, um, it's just like it just doesn't me. resonate with you. Well, it, not not even just that. Just like it doesn't. It's not human. Like for right, better true. or for worse. And and you know there there are certainly upsides to to mechanical playing i i wish i was more mechanical on demand i wish i could just kind of like flip the switch and be like okay i'm running out of gas i need to like right <sighs> proper posture wrists and fingers and whatever <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> but like just the way he approached it was both the first time i i could could really grasp it but also like the first time i had any interest in it uh-huh jane doe and and forward spoke to me in a way that like heavy music before that didn't and most frankly still doesn't right um I, I, heavy music is like i, I don't know I, I i really just am not interested in most of it which is hilarious given that it's the it's a, a major major factor in your life yeah yeah and you play um, in a band that's heavy as fuck yeah i mean it's it's <laughs> it's like an exercise you know it's right it's a it's a thing we get to do and it's and it's i don't want to say it's fun i mean it is fun but that's like not exactly the point but it is part of the point. If you're not enjoying it, you wouldn't be doing it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's let's not bullshit it. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I don't know. The list is kind of short. I know what you're saying, and I gravitate towards players and the music that they play as well, which is part of it. I think at a, at some point when everything gets so quantized, triggered, etc., it it becomes it, it takes such the human element out of it that it doesn't have sort of that raw connectivity uh, yeah. for my ear or uh, anymore. So yeah, guys like Ben Kohler, like I said, Nick Yakushin with Baptist, and like once again, what's funny is that I'm sitting here and we're all talking about records that that Kurt Ballou has done. Yeah, between yeah. Baptist and at least it Converge, and you know. I love Ben's playing a Mutoid Man and All Pigs oh, Must yeah, Die yeah, and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. I'm I'm trying to think of some stuff in between. So there was a kick where I was, I mean, it was mostly like indie drummers. Nick Dewitt with uh, Pretty Girls Make Graves. Oh, okay, I know of the band. I'm not too familiar. with There them, are a couple though. little things he would do that made that just oh that has stuck with me from the time I picked it up through now. It's just yeah. like part of how I play. Cornbread Compton from Engine Down. Well, he I've heard a lot of people talk about him. He the way he interprets groove is just so it was still absolutely groove and in the pocket and felt good, but it yeah. was just like you know, stuff that like when you talk about it, it seems kind of simple, like, oh well, I'll flip the backbeat so it's on top. But lots of flams and lots of like angular hi hat playing cool. and I can't remember the the guy's name. He's the guitarist in Engine Down, but he played drums in uh, Denali. But he he was big. Denali was one of my favorite bands. Nice. Um, but uh, like a lot of stuff that between you know like the heavy stuff is just like, how do you fill out your playing? How do you like make it not boxy, emotive and real and human and interesting? Uh, well, let me just ask you this. I guess when when Gaza was first starting out, what did how did how did that band come together? Because that was uh, obviously there's there's from the members to cult leader. There's that through line, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. And musically, I still hear it as as you would because it's still you and the guitarist, and you know y'all are doing your thing. But I guess when Gaza was was first starting, how did you how how did you and the guitarist connect? There's there's the ultimate so, question. So me and Mike, yeah, or Mike and I, uh, we actually went to school together. 
Okay. In Clearfield, Utah. And uh, we, we had a lot of um, common friends but didn't know each other. Okay. And uh, we were kind of the players of our respective instruments in our respective in our respective social circles. Were y'all bouncing heavy music off of each other? Or no. It, it, it's, a, it's very much an odd couple thing because Mike was like, he was shredding Van Halen and nice. the first song he learned was, uh, I think, Under the Bridge by the Red, Hot Red Chili, Hot Chili Peppers. Peppers. Wow. By the way, that was his first, like, he just, like, sat down and learned that. He didn't, I don't think he had tabs Really? He just, like, whoa, absolute That's unbridled <laughs> maniacal genius. <laughs> Truly. If, if I meet anyone more intelligent and talented than Mike Mason, I will be shocked. Okay. Um, and he was, I think he was on like the basketball team and he picked up a guitar one day and then he was just kind of like, eh. So he's like a really great basketball player too. Really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we geek out about the jazz and what I can't play like him, but, right. um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, Mike, Mike just loved that kind of stuff. Just like loved the technicality of it. And, so we didn't have like really a common musical vocabulary. I really? just played and he just played. And so our common friends for like months were like, you got to play with this guy. You got to play with this guy. Yeah. Finally got us together in some bass. I don't, I don't know if we'd ever really talked before that. How old were you? Or the, I was, you? I was 17. He was 16. Wow. And, uh, we, so we found what we had in common, which was incubus. Nice. And thrice. <laughs> okay. And, uh, that was like kind of it. Yeah. But that's still like a, a fair amount of material. And then I was like, hey, you should check out Glassjaw. And I should check out this and you should check out that. Oh, right on. We just, I don't know. It just, especially in suburban communities out in the goddamn middle of nowhere. Like yeah. you have to find people that you can play with. Right. And I, I feel like that's, that's really where you get interesting groupings of musicians is sure. when they're like, when you're in junior high and a high school you're just thrown out there and, and you're no you're not just like in this homogenized circle of people uh-huh. with established whatever's and whatever's like i've learned how to play drums because i've played with mike and i feel like mike's learned how to play guitar because he's played with me like sure yeah you grew up learning your instruments together yeah. and 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 formed part of your identity musically off of what has happened between the two of you yeah, yeah. so it's this kind of interesting relationship it's there. like a familial level of play right it's um well i'm an only child so i always when i hooked up with people that loved music the same way that i did and musicians and everything there's always been that familial connection just because for me i didn't have siblings so maybe i sought that out and that's something that i've always felt like they're you know my bandmates are my brothers you know and yeah you know with the exceptions and well i guess i could even say the ones that i've wanted to strangle they're my brothers too just some more so than others. I can go on <laughs> about this, but I, I, I think being in a band is like blood doesn't have to define family. And to me, what like what love is and what family is, is something greater than enjoying your time with someone. That's candy. That's great. Yeah. I love candy. Sure. But <laughs> but like when it, when the chips are down and things aren't great, like what then? Right. And what's thicker than that frustration or what's stronger than that you have to have something else beyond good times and and whatever to to fall back on I'm a fan of your state, by the way. Uh, I've gone out there, out to like Escalante and out in the slot canyons and oh, wow. and done, you know, Zion and Bryce Canyon and all that shit. Damn. And I swear, man, it's Mars on Earth. There's nowhere in the on this planet that looks and exists like that place does. It's really crazy. Have you been to the Cosmic Ashtray by any chance out in the fucking desert, dude? No. So there's this place 
I had a guy take me and my ex-wife, and I'll tell you why she's now my ex-wife, <laughs> and it had a lot to do with that fucking vacation. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> basically, it's, it is uh, the wind has carved out a, a big bowl, basically, into like a piece of a mountain or something like that. But there's a giant rock still in the center of it, and you can hike down into this thing, and the acoustics are insane. When you clap, it's like real rapid reverberation and everything, and huh. it's the most bizarre place, and it's called the Cosmic Ashtray. And I've been to it, and we did, a, we did a trek with this guy out there, and we didn't see, he saw boot prints, and he's like, those are mine from a month ago. Like, there was, there's no one out there. Hmm. And it's 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 so incredible, man. Do you, do you know what region it is, or like what? Uh, Escalante. Okay. Yeah, huh. it's crazy. Check out the check. You could just Google it. You'll see an image of it. Yeah, I I, I like getting out. <laughs> I, I haven't spent enough time in like the south southern regions of the state. Ah, oh, it's so awesome. Um, but I definitely want to like get into canyoneering and right and dude like you're in the state for it man you exactly, gotta do it well yeah. you have time but also obviously be careful because that's where i'm going with this is that we did a trek uh by ourselves and he just drew me a little diagram and dude i'm from the south man i'm a flatlander like swamps I, that's my environment you know yeah, yeah and then i i go out there and i'm just i was so out of my element and they tell you that when it starts to rain you got to get out of the get slot canyons out. because they can have flash floods yes. and you'll fucking die yes so that is what happened not the flash floods but it started to rain so we got out and I realized I have no idea I can't orient myself and at that point I started to realize we might be lost and my ex-wife who was she, she was Latin American she was like it is your fault we are going to fucking die the coyotes they're going to eat our fucking eyes out and I was like you know what man I realize this is a little fucked right now we're not totally lost you know but blaming me for your death is a little extreme and I gotta say at that moment I was like I don't know I want to be married to her anymore uh, so that would, that might have been where it started. Then I was like, yeah, yeah. Well. but that will bring out extreme circumstances. And as my buddy said, it's no country for old men. You can straight up die out there. Oh yeah, and no one will find you. And <laughs> and in a sick way, like I don't know, that's part of the appeal. appeal. Dude, like, of course it is. You know, like the adrenaline rush. Or like, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Like, How about just not seeing or hearing humanity or any of it, industry, and none of that. It's just fucking wind out there. You can see the stars, actually. You can, like... If you want to stay out there at night, and he, yeah, that's that's an option that I do want. I want to go back and do that. I want to trek out there and spend, like, a night or two out there. Yeah. So I'm a fan of your state is, is, the, is the short yeah. hand. Yeah, I, I am, too. <laughs> I am, too. That's cool, man. Well, shit, Casey, it was fun talking to you, dude. Uh, I look forward to uh, checking out the show tonight. Congrats on the record. Thank Sounds you. great. Always a fan of your plan. Don't burn yourself out. Hydrate, stretch. I don't know what kind of warm-up routines you have. I got to hydrate. Do you have, do you have, a, do you have a symbol endorsement? Hell no. Oh, dude. You, <laughs> you need one like no one I've ever seen. I, 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 should, I should probably look into that kind of stuff. I'm just... I'm just, I don't know. I'm just not the kind of person that's like, hey, look how great I am. Now give me stuff. Right. <laughs> you need someone to do that for you so that yeah, you don't feel yeah, guilty maybe, about it. Probably. Okay. Uh, all right. All right. But yeah. Right on, dude. Well, you need it. So hopefully one of these days. I'm learning. Gl yeah. Glancing blows and all that stuff. <laughs> Fuck that. Go beat that shit. That's what you do, man. Don't apologize for it. All right, Casey. Good talking to you, man. Hell yeah, man. Thanks. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks to Casey for the candid interview, and of course, being such a wrecking ball of a drummer. Shit's fascinating to witness. We'll catch you on the next one. Cosmic ashtrays and all. Crash bang boom!